quick recap from uh, uh, last night, uh, and we'll look at um, more or less last night was an overview, but also kind of the science behind um, the transgender uh, agenda, and we see that it's not really backed up by true science. Today, in this, the morning session, we'll look at um, what the world says, again, a bit more into what we find in uh, this whole um, the situation, uh, followed by what the church says, and then our response. So it's also part of like an ongoing dialogue. We also have two sessions today of kind of like roundtable discussions. Uh, hopefully they will turn into you know, gripe sessions or things that are overwhelmingly over depressing. But um, I do have some solutions, whether or not they actually work, you see. So the transgender agenda are turned in dialogue. Okay, if it works. So, so reminding ourselves of some definitions, we have uh, those who identify as transgender claim that their gender, their self-identification as a man or a woman, does not match their biological sex, or what they sometimes refer to as their assigned sex. A transgender man then, is a biological woman who now identifies as a man. A transgender woman is a biological man who identifies who now identifies as a woman. Remember, trans means to go across, across. So, um, uh, those are very basic definitions. I have to remind myself because I get confused with even basic definitions these days. And of course, they're always changing. Okay, we'll it. So, among those things that um, Just as an example, I got this off a website. Um, it was either a transgender website or LGBTQ website or something. And looking at um, this is, you may not find this helpful, but this is like all the different words or ways people can identify. Uh, and um, it was too much to kind of type out. <clears throat> so I said, oh, this isn't the whole list either. And these are words you may have heard, uh, obviously, so we look at, uh, does anyone have one? Okay. 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 So sexuality, uh, we'll see this later, it's kind of helpful, uh, but this is just kind of what's out there in case you don't know. <clears throat> So sexuality refers to romantic orientation, that is, who you are romantically attracted to, meaning wanting to be in a romantic relationship with that is unrelated to sexual attraction. And sexual orientation, again, according, if, I'm sorry, I don't know the website, regrettably these definitions kind of change day to day or week to week depending upon who you talk to. Who you are sexually attracted to means meaning who you get turned on by or who you want to engage in sexual behaviors with. And that's important when we look at what is being taught in our schools. We'll see that a little bit later. So again, kind of heterosexual, homosexual, we go down the list there, pansexual, bi-curious, and all these sort of definitions. I think some of the definitions uh, you could see either they, they cover the same thing. It's, it's hard to see how all these, we get all these different genders from what people are saying. And it's obvious that people are making up certain things. Uh, on the second page, the back page here, uh, you have gender and sex in the middle. So sex would be your assigned gender at birth and or the gender of your reproductive organs. Gender is where you feel that you personally fall on the spectrum between male and female. Commonly, people identify as male or female, but some fall in the middle or move through the spectrum. Cisgender is when you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. So I guess I'm cisgender. Um, but then, up at the top, like six definitions above, where it says, cisgender? That's someone who is both 
cisgendered and heterosexual. This is sometimes used as a slur. So I guess that means a cishet too. Um, but that's in a, a way of attacking me and attacking anyone that prior to 10 years ago meant that you were normal. But anyway, that's what this is like. We have to see things. I'm just trying to truly understand where they're coming from. And uh, usually I can do that in most arguments. I just find it really difficult without making fun of anyone in, in this particular case to kind of put all these definitions together. And of course, uh, back to gender and sex and that the middle of that other page, what I call the other page. Transgender, when you identify with a gender different than you were assigned at birth, and transsexual is when you have had gender reassignment surgery, GRS, to change the sexual organs you were born with to that of a different gender. And at the bottom you see by gender, part of the definition is cut off because there's still two more pages of this, I don't want to bore you with, with all the, I just want to give a sampling, and I think that these are kind of like there. Uh, and it's just, that's just the reality that we kind of deal with in today's world, with reality of the small part of course. History, okay. What is common in women that makes them women, and in men that makes them men? So, um, Alameda kind of tip me off to this, there's this uh, Matt Walsh, who I guess is a political commentator, has this um, piece on the the internet called What is a Woman? He goes around interviewing people, what a woman is, and, and no one can really uh, give a definition or a proper definition. And people would just say that he's a hate monger or a baby, and he's just trying to ask a simple question. This question, of course, was asked recently to a Supreme Court Justice nominee, who's now a Supreme Court Justice. Can you get to find what a woman is? And I never saw the hearings, but I understand that she couldn't. So, um, and she said that uh, I'm not a biologist. Oh, not a biologist. Okay. <laughs> so I was thinking, if anyone wanted to, this is called The Concept of Women. Uh, it's a big, thick book. It's by Sister Prudence Allen. And this is volume three. And Sister Prudence Allen did three big, fat volumes like this. She's a great theologian. And she examined from, like, 2000 BC to the year 2015, how the concept of woman has changed our history. And so maybe maybe they're right, maybe we kind of don't know, but what's very fascinating, and she's writing from a Catholic perspective, that at the very end of the book, she credits uh, Pope St. John Paul de Great with the, she gives him a special title, because everyone tries to figure out what, what a woman is, and she says the one that nails it on the spot is John Paul II. So she devotes the last um, 50 pages or so of her work to him. Um, she calls him, quote, the apostle of integral complementarity. And we'll see that in a second, uh, how he's the apostle of integral complementarity, because throughout history, we have concepts that women are less than men, that women are slaves or things like that, or in the ancient world, we have a change of that concept with Christianity, there's a type of equality. Uh, we have the rise of different feminists throughout history from the Middle Ages, like Hildegard of Bingen and others, and they have different concepts of women. So it is an interesting study. It's three volumes. If anyone wanted to, they can, they can buy it, I'm sure, on Amazon or something, and send it to some people who might be help you find what a woman is. <laughs> it's called The Concept of Woman. The Concept of Woman. It's three volumes, I volume three with me. So I'm going to quote from it later. Okay, so here it is, my quote later. So the Sufi Kuhnis Island says, quote, the foundation for integral complementarity, that's what John Paul II is the apostle of, established by humanist philosophers will be overturned by the infusion of Cartesian arguments in support of gender unity, unisex. So Rene Descartes is someone who comes along in the 1650, he writes his meditations, and basically he says this, with the Cartesian turn to the subject, so you start your philosophy, that's kind of what happens, the human being is characterized as a thinking thing, the red spider cop versus the red extensor, which is the extended thing. And so, I think, therefore I am. And so what he's saying is, I'm a thinking thing. And by doing that, what Descartes is 
would split and what I'm jumping ahead and missing is, of course, the Aristotelian Thomistic argument that we are solar body composites. And so what Descartes is saying is that no, we're just, we're just spiritual, we're just a thinking thing. And so the momentum towards a new theory of vegetable complementarity of stock overcome by the Cartesian revolution. And so again, uh, Kunasal is making a, a big uh, thousand page plus argument as to what a woman is and looking at that her history. And she sees like, that Descartes messed the thing up on the way. Now, she also makes another argument here that I won't time to go into, but um, this radical dominance of a single theory, now the Descartes theory of the 1600s, of gender identity is similar to the Aristotelian revolution of the 13th century that overturned the original momentum for gender complementarity initiated by the Benedictine influence. So she sees influences in Benedictine monasteries on St. Bernard of Clairvaux and others, and Hildegard of Bingen, working towards a sense of a complementarity of women and men. Now, it's not that uh, Aristotle, Aristotle, of course, is wrong in some of the things he says, but it quite directs him. But she was saying there was a certain trajectory that kind of went in a different direction. That trajectory goes in another direction later with kind of today's saints, or their friends, Teresa of Avon and John the Cross and the Carmelite tradition, uh, and then looking at uh, what happens with John the Cross seed, the soul is sort of espoused to the Lord, and what the apostle of, of integral complementarity, John Paul II does, he kind of takes all these other philosophies, puts them together, purifies them to his own thought, and, can, and uses John the Cross, because he did a thesis on John the Cross in his student days, and, and sees, uh, sees this notion of, of the spousal, how the body is, has a, a spousal or nuptial meaning to it. <coughs> The issue of the concept of woman continues a dramatic process, progress to the rationalism of the 18th century, followed by other phases in the 19th and 20th centuries. That's not through all the phases. Last night, Dr. Pons is kind of beginning with the middle of the 20th century and forward, but this thing begins, of course, going back to Adam and Eve in the fall, where all the mistakes are being made in the first place. So, this is Christian faith and human understanding by Robert Sokolowski who kind of says the same thing. A major change occurred in Western thinking about 500 years ago. This change initiated what we call the modern age. It took place in our understanding of ethics and politics, as well as our understanding of science and nature. The basic idea was introduced at that time that was the claim that things do not have natures or forms. This denial of nature Definitions and ends extended even to human beings and their communities. So again, we see the seeds of that, and what I'm trying to do is connect the fact that we don't know who we are, so of course, the whole philosophy is wrong, and everything, the underpinnings of who we are as human creatures is tossed off, making it accessible or fashionable to make up who I am. Um, but what Aquinas did, of course, uh, believes in things called essences and natures. And, and we, we can grasp that by simply saying, if I said the word tree, you have, the word, you have a tree in your mind. Uh, and we can grasp the essence of the natures of things. We know that because we're spiritual beings. And the way we put it is this. If I had in front of me, if, like we had two dogs, like, um, I'm sorry, I don't think that. Uh, we have a dog, like a chihuahua, a creature that we call chihuahua, and an animal we call lion. And I said, which one is the dog? Now typically dogs are bigger than cats. Which is the dog, which is the cat? Which is the cat nature? And what has the dog nature? All of us, even though the chihuahua was small, would still say, well, that little thing is the dog, and that bigger creature here, this lion, is like the cat, the feline nature. Because we can uh, derive the essences of things, because we have the ability to extrapolate the essences in our minds and connect with things we know in the past. And that's how we that's how we, we learn. And all of us can do that. And as Dr. Powell was saying last night, we can look in a room and we can see different people, sizes and shapes, hairstyles, fashions and stuff like that. But we can all know 
what a man is and what a woman is. Well, that one's a woman, that one's a man. Either people are that bigger ball or things like that, or it's a heavy set woman. She's still a woman. As Anthony Ashley reminds us, the sex of the other person that I'm talking to, it's the first thing that I notice, and it's the last thing that stays with me. We immediately intuit that someone's essence is. What's happening with this transgender is that we're saying there's no more essences. There's no more essences, there's no more nature. And that's just philosophically wrong and it upsets the whole uh, way of thinking, the way that the church does things, and who we are as human creatures. So philosophy continues. I think that we all know the historical figures associated with the new and human thought Machiavelli and Hobbes in regards to ethics and politics, and Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes in regard to science and nature. This comprehension. Comprehensive adjustment in human thinking got played out in later years through other familiar thinkers of modern age. John Locke, David Hume, John Jacques Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, among others, and again in the 20th century, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre. One could also see precursors of this major change in the late Middle Ages, especially William of Ockham, who happened to be Franciscan. My apologies. <laughs> this was the great reversal in which truth becomes subordinated to freedom. There's no more truth anymore. It's what I make of it, it's freedom, it's my will, and I'm imposing my belief system on what the truth is. Before that, we used our senses to determine what truth was. Truth is something outside of me. Truth is something objective. Truth is something I need to discover. But now, truth is something that I make up for myself. Uh, with Machiavelli, among others, he says in his The Prince, society will be more stable if people stop being loving and generous toward one another and appeal to their own self-interest. Hence, we need to lower at our ambitions as a Christian people. We cannot trust the better natures of others, and so we're building a society on people's self-interest. And that has played out in different topics, different ways through like later economic theories and stuff like that. Uh, and because we can't trust each other, the same thing with Hobbes, like um, man is uh, the life of man is uh, brutish and short, and that nature is uh, we see nature with like uh, red with um, claw and with tooth and claw, and that we. And that the whole world that is up for number one, looking out for themselves. <clears throat> and William of Ockham was the first one, right after he lived, like, uh, Aquinas died in 1275, and Ockham was, began his philosophical uh, overturn in like around 1310 or so. So within a generation of Aquinas, he reached this high point of philosophy. And Ockham begins to undo it. He was the first one to sort of deny that there were natures. And then through Ockham, we have Gabriel Biel in the next century who's teaching the same thing. And Gabriel Biel, his, with his philosophy of that, you know, of nominalism, this is only a name. It's a name what I give it. This isn't, there's no essence of podium. It's just I call this thing podium. Therefore, it is. There's no essence of man. It's just what I, I call that thing. It could be a woman if I wanted to. That's where we're at. And it was Biel who kind of like, his thought is what influenced Martin Luther. And so Martin Luther could say things after, like, is that really the body of Christ? And the process can be denied what we teach in the Eucharist. If there's no essence, then there's no essence of divinity or essence of humanity. And we find, uh, <coughs> uh, follow the money, it's all origin. So we kind of skip through the to the 20th century. We do have this sort of transgender notion from Dr. John Money and the Rainbow Twins at John Hopkins University. So, you know, I'll just read from Prudence Allen's book. I mean, there's lots of errors. There's the, you know, Alfred Kinsey and other people like that. But just as an example, kind of like the, the initial sort of genesis of this whole thing, is so Dr. Money is at John Hopkins University. He was at Harvard and had his own theory about sexuality. 
<clears throat> and believed that uh, sexuality was like fluid, that you can kind of move between, uh, he, was, he was, began thinking in terms of these sort of gender theories. And he began to research like hermaphrodites. And after Money's research method of arguing from hermaphrodites, that is people who are intersexed, who uh, don't seem to be male or female, but here's the thing. Um, we're all born, of course, male or female. We're not born trans. We're not born gay. There's no proof that's a gay gene. We're not born transgender. <laughs> because who we are, you see, we are in our bodies, in our DNA. And then we sell of our body, either male or female. <clears throat> so, he thought that he found a perfect control experiment <clears throat> to, to prove his gender theory at John Hopkins at the gender identity clinic. The Raymer twins were identical male twins born in 1965. They were brought there to Dr. Money by their parents to the clinic. After one twin lost his penis, though poorly performed circumcision, Money recommended bringing up the wounded son as a girl, surgically, medically, psychologically, and socially. He insisted that this not be revealed in any way to either child, but that the name of the wounded boy would be changed from Bruce to Brenda. Money used pornography and encouraged sex play through his session with the children. He abused us. In spite of all this deception, the experiment was a failure, as Brenda, now Brenda, continued to act like a typical boy in school and at home. And he's telling everyone that he's successful. In spite of this massive failure, money always publicly pro proclaimed that it was a success. In other words, he forged his data. <coughs> And in 1972, a shift from academic professionals to broad audiences occurred when money began to publish his book, Findings. <clears throat> and the book was Man and Woman, Boy and Girl, The Differentiation and Dimorphism of Gender Identity from Conception to Maturity. In this book, he intentionally deceived the public. Money proclaimed that the great success of the twins' experiment, even though he knew it was always failing, he stated proudly after describing the success in gender identity differentiation among human hermaphrodites. And he quote, said, quote, a similar extraordinary contrast has been observed in which a child born as a normal male was surgically reassigned as a female. In gender behavior, she is quite gender different than her identical twin brother. End quote. The book was praised by the New York Times by the Kinsey Report and other places, even though he lied. In 1975, Dr. Paul McHugh, who was also working at John Hopkins University, he was appointed psychiatrist-in-chief, and he has been there almost until a few years ago. McHugh requested a systematic study of those who had gender identity changes at the gender clinic. After two years, he realized that, quote, we in the John Hopkins Psychiatry Department eventually concluded that human sexual identity is mostly built in, into our constitution by the genes we inherit and by the embry embryogenesis we undergo. In 1979, Dr. McHugh closed down the gender identity clinic and soon afterward moved Dr. Bunny's office <coughs> off campus and limited his teaching. However, John Money continued to publish his false claims about the gender gate, about the gender gate that you sort of pass through, and his so-called proof for changing a normal male to a female. So just based on lies. But because we tell a lie, we keep telling it, the press picks up on it, it's all over the place. Yes, it works. It doesn't work, it doesn't work, it's never worked, it's not true, it doesn't work now, and it never will, because you can't go against human nature. Anyway, uh, 
Bruce and Brenda went back to Bruce later when he found out the, the whole fraud, and he eventually got married, but because of everything that's happened in his life, he tragically committed suicide in the year 2005. And Dr. Mundy died in 2006. <coughs> the genuine right person. So, this is like what's being... So, because we think this is true, this is what's actually happening now in, in our schools. <coughs> From like, in different public schools across the country, we have this thing called <coughs> the gender person and the gender beautiful. And what we do is of teaching children from kindergarten onward that they can choose who they are and choose their sex and things like that. I'm going to go to the other slide, but that's the transplant of the gender-bred man or the gender-bred person. And so uh, you have copies of that slide for you to kind of it's too small to read. But a bit more clearly. <coughs> The gender unicorn. So basically, this is from the TSR website. The TSR website is the trans student, uh, trans student educational resource website. And basically, they said they get all these genders we looked at earlier, but still I can't comprehend how we get over like 60 or 70 more. So here, yeah, the little rainbow on the head is gender identity. That's what I, I think I am. That's what it all counts. You can be female, woman, or girl, male, man, or boy, or other. That's the, the rainbow. And then the little dots around the unicorn, that's the gender express. That's my problem. That's how I dress, how I present myself. So maybe, me, for me personally, of course, I'm a man, but maybe I dress like a woman because I just kind of dress on or something, so they would say I express myself in a kind of way, but that's not true. Anyway, uh, how do you express yourself? Feminine, masculine, or other? And then the, the DNA around the genital area, that's the, the sex assigned at birth, so you can be female, male, in, other, intersex. But again, intersex, being a macrodite, isn't, it's, it's more we can just say, I mean, why people born that way? Well, some people born blind. Some people born without limbs. It's just an effect of original sin. Listen, who is here with perfect? No one is born perfect. No one lives perfectly. In God's creation, it's entirely possible that there are some people who suffer with that in the same way that there are people who don't have perfect sight. Mm -hmm. I wear glasses. Mm -hmm. In the same way that you might other oh, people to have headaches all the time. There are psychological wounds that we have. There are physical wounds that we have. We're simply born with. Think of Tony Melendez. Here's a man who's born without leg, without arms. What does a man do who's born without arms? You can sit down and you can curse God all day. Why don't you give me arms? So you can praise God using your feet. And your music. We have suffering. What do we do with our suffering? Are they stumbling blocks? Or are they stepping stones of obedience? When there are difficulties psychologically or with one's sexuality, can I offer up those sufferings to the Lord? Can he unite them to his cross? So, and then the, the two hearts here, that was again the orange line, those that are physically attracted to. And then the red one, the red heart, is woman, man, or other, who I'm not emotionally attracted to. So physical, oh, so I'm all trying to look at that person. And then I'm emotionally attracted to someone else. And so all these things can flip back and forth. One could be man or woman, one could be attracted to this, one could be attracted to the opposite sex, but then romantically attracted to someone else. I could be a little boy who's six years old and I have another little boy that I'm a friend with. That's what happens to little boys, they're friends with each other. Oh no, 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 Johnny. So you're emotionally attracted to that other little boy. You're, you're you see, that means you're, you're special. You have a different gender. Let's go look at which gender you might be. 
because we don't believe anymore in what the church teaches on the truth of human sexuality that there's a latency period. Of course, we believe that. It's like little boys think little girls are icky. We've always known that. You wouldn't be attracted to a little girl when you were six years old. It's just that kind of happens with you know when you're older, 11, 12, puberty begins to oh wow, look at her. It's just like I never noticed her before, or something like that. You know, it's just that's what happens. But so that's how they, they teach children, they give them a certain vocabulary to express things that they can't really express to things that don't really matter. They say if you like the little boy, you're a little boy, you must be trans. You must be someone else. And therefore, I have to tell my mommy and daddy that. No, 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 no. Don't tell your parents. Mm -hmm. We can keep it quiet here. There are public schools in this country, in the state of Massachusetts, where, because we, we have to, because remember, it's the state now, the state's in control of everything. So we can't tell parents, so your child, so Johnny, who can, who has expressed attraction, emotional attraction to Bobby, because they're both playmates and stuff like that, they're eight years old, that the teacher of the guidance council can, when Johnny comes into school, we can take him to a little closet, he can dress up as a girl during the day, he can walk around and call himself Wanda, and then at the end of the day, he can put the little dress back, and put it in the closet, and then just go back home. And then mom and dad never know. And this is happening right now. So questions. What is true? Is it subjective? Is it something that I make up into myself? Or is it objective? Is it something that I discover? What is freedom? To do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want? Or is freedom for a deeper reason? This freedom of choice, or as Sir Ray's Pink I guess, the great Dominican moral theologian reminds us, freedom of indifference. I have this first level of freedom to choose, but I choose for a greater freedom. I live for the freedom of excellence. And that is, I'm free to perfect myself as a human creature. So the freedom of excellence, so I want to be a great pianist. I'm free to take lessons. I'm free to learn what these black keys and white keys are. If I'm totally free to do whatever I want, I can sit in front of the piano and go, and play whatever notes I want because I'm free. Don't make fun of me. But if I use my freedom of choice, the freedom of excellence, I study, I learn, and I play the keys, the piano, the pocket notes can, or Mozart, or Bach. I'm free to be a good pianist. I'm free for excellence. And that's how we judge things in sports. I mean, of course I could play basketball and shoot the hoops on this side of the court where I am, but those points don't count for anything. I have to go, my goal is over here. That's the rules of the game. If I step out of the boundaries, it's no longer my ball. It goes the other team. But we have a lot of rules and limitations on our freedom. That's how we determine who's better than the other person. That's who we give the awards to. The person that comes in first in the finish line, not the last. The real question isn't what is truth and what is freedom. It's what is it to be a human being that strives for excellence? And how does that human being use his gifts to grow in virtue? When I look at true freedom as a human creature, where do I see the saints? I see Jesus and Mary. I see St. Francis, Teresa of Avila, people who have used their gifts and their choices to do what protects them as human creatures. I want to be a great pianist, I play the piano. I want to be a great basketball player, I shoot hoops all the time. I want to be a good human person, I become a saint. That's why freedom is full. This seems a bit short, but actually that's the end of the first presentation. Let me take one. And the next one.